So who is this God that Hezekiah worshipped? God of Israel, we say, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and, and it's the same God that we worship, is it not? We have a Judeo-Christian faith. We say that because it comes out of Judaism. It comes out of the Old Testament, which I'm so proud of the kids as they have learned the Old Testament. Maybe we need to do a contest for the moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas. And, hmm. Wow. <laughs> There's so much about God that we don't know. But there is quite a bit about him that we can know if we seek for him and we search for him with all our hearts. We say, ah, oh, Pastor, I know all about God. I'm afraid we are guilty sometimes of, of knowing just enough to think we can get by and say, oh, okay, that's all right. When God invites us over and over and over, know the Lord, know the Lord. In Ezekiel, it says, the day will come when every neighbor will say to each other, know the Lord. And so I say to you, who is this God that we serve? I want to invite you over the next several weeks as we go into the summer to join me on this incredible adventure of knowing the God that we serve. To know him better. It was May 15, 1967. I was 12 years old. And I didn't know very much about the Middle East. Knew nothing. Heard of it. Israel was celebrating their Independence Day. And they were rejoicing in the fact that they had become a nation not many years before. But there were ominous clouds on the horizon because their Independence Day was overshadowed by Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, and Iran, who had surrounded Israel and said, it's our intent, we're going to wipe them off the face of the earth. The Allied Arab forces boasted nearly half a million troops. Israel. Israel is not very big. Israel could muster maybe 200,000. Half a million troops surrounded on every side. The naysayers were saying, we need to get ready for the second Holocaust. They began preparing, enlarging their hospitals. They had set aside parks for burial spaces. The doomsayer says, we're done. <laughs> We might as well surrender. We might as well give up. Backed by the Soviet Union, the Arabs possessed twice as many tanks, four times the number of aircraft. Israel turned to the United States. I'm trying to remember who the president was in. Was it Nixon? 67? Ford? Somebody help. I don't know. You have to Google it. Was it Johnson? 1967. Really? 64, 63, it was Johnson, Linda B. Johnson. Not necessarily known to be a friend of Israel, by the way. Israel said, you got to help us. Said, well, we don't, we don't want to get on the wrong side of the Soviet Union and the Arabs, so we're just going to stay out of this. And we did. The Arab nations... <laughs> rub their hands together, and lick their chop to say for the imminent massacre that was going to happen. Hmm. The president of Iraq declared the existence of Israel is an error that must be rectified. This is our opportunity to, to wipe the ignominy which has been with us since 1948. Our goal is clear to wipe Israel off the map. Isn't it interesting that 50 years hasn't changed much, has it? The president of Iran, our goal is to wipe Israel off the map. The spirit of fear and despair hung over the nation. The dream of a Jewish state seemed to be 
about to be snuffed out. The surrounding Arab nations anticipated a quick and complete end to the nation of Israel. What they didn't anticipate was the fact that God was the defender of Israel. The anticipated defeat would be their own. I didn't know much at 12 years of age, but I have done some reading. That, 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 that six-day war literally was over in three days. And we began to read some of the miraculous things that happened. Okay? June 5th, the war started. They fired missiles into Israel. Israel responded, put their planes in the air, flying low over the airspace so as not to be detected. And, and the radar in Jordan picked up, there's aircraft flying, and they signaled to Egypt, you better watch out, they're coming. What Egypt didn't know was that they had changed the code, and they didn't get the message. Miraculously, it was as though something intervened and, and Egypt was unaware that Israeli jets were headed their way. Over 300 Egyptian aircraft and Jordanian aircraft were destroyed on the, on the, on the ground. Didn't even get off the air. That was day one. Wiped out their Air Force. There were several hundred thousand Egyptian troops amassed on the western border. And so they were going to make the offensive. And so the Israelis, all right, you know, maybe something. And they began going after the Egyptian troops. And when they got there, something incredible happened. Tanks were abandoned. The, the Egyptian army, for some reason, was thrown into confusion, and they heard bombs going off, and they, and they literally ran back to Egypt, left their tanks, their artillery, and, and everything, and, and, and went back home. When the Israelis got there, like, where is everybody? Where, 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 what? So they, they took all of the armament that was abandoned, and it, it, it was enough armament to outfit five regiments of Israeli soldiers. Tanks, artillery, wow. By this time, things were beginning to, the, the Arab forces are going, what is going on here? We're, this is day two. Day three, the Arabs wanted to make a ceasefire. And so they said, whoa, 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 we want to call a ceasefire here. We're, they began to see the handwriting on the wall. And, and so Israel's like, well, we're open for that. But it was a ruse, and the Arab says, we're not ceasefire. No, we're going after you. On the northern bank of Syria, there was 76,000 Syrian troops that were in the Golan Heights region, and they were entrenched and they were embedded. They had underground bunkers. They had been preparing for this for, for years. Israel had a handful of soldiers that said, what are we going to do? So we're going after them. <laughs> when they went after the 76,000 Syrian troops, the record says that when they began their offensive, they discovered that the Syrians had fled their own positions in retreat, leaving behind their ammunition and their hardware. It was as though something had come against them, and they're like, we're out of here, Boom, and they took off. That was day four. Basically, the war was over. All they did was continue to take more territory, they began to enlarge. They, they took the, the western side that's called the West Bank. You hear that? It included the old part of Jerusalem where the Temple Mount was. They took the Golan Heights. They took all of this territory that had not been in Jewish hands for over 2,000 years. They took Hebron. And in just six days, the Arabs said, we give up. We're, we're done. We're, we're, we're. They called a ceasefire. 
and, and Israel gained the victory. Now, historians look at that and go, whoa, what happened? Were these Israelis so, such good fighters that they, that, they, that they put the enemy on the run? No. In fact, Israel itself rejoiced. God has defended us. God has fought for us. We don't know why they, they ran. We don't know why we have that. We, we just know that God has performed a miracle and we still exist. For those who know the history of Israel, it isn't hard to understand at all. God was the defender of Israel. He has been from the very beginning and he will continue to until the very end. Now, this isn't the first time that God came to the defense of his people. In fact, in the year 701, King Hezekiah had been on the throne for 14 years at the age of 25, as our leader has shared. He came to the throne after, his, after the death of his father Ahaz. Ahaz was one of the most wicked kings ever to set on the throne of Judah. Now you got to remember, you got the northern ten tribes, that's Israel, okay, a little history here. The southern two tribes were Judah, okay. Israel had 20 kings, they were all wicked, they did evil all the time. Didn't have one good king. The southern kingdom of Judah had 20 kings, but there were some good and some bad. Ahaz was a horrible king. The Scripture says that Ahaz did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel. He made idols for worshiping the Baals. He burned sacrifices in the valley of Ben-Hinnon. He sacrificed his own children in the fire, engaged in the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He offered sacrifices and burnt incense at the high places on the hilltops and under every spreading tree. You see, they thought the higher you got, the more you, God would hear you better. And so you, if you found the highest hilltop, you could pray to God and, and you would have clear reception, right? You know, They prayed to gods that couldn't hear. Therefore, the Lord his God delivered him into the hands of the king of Aram, and the Arameans defeated Ahaz and took away many of the people as prisoners and brought them to Damascus. He was also given into the hands of the king of Israel, who inflicted many casualties. In one day, Pekah, the, the king of Israel, killed 120,000 soldiers in Judah because Judah had forsaken the Lord the God of their ancestors. You say, well, I thought God was supposed to defend them. God will not defend those who do not serve Him. Thanks, Myron. we got a lot of people in our world today. Oh God, you got to help me, you got to help me. But they don't even give one moment of their time, their resources, or anything to honoring God. God, you got to help me. Let me just add here, any nation that decides that they don't want to follow the Lord, they don't want to keep His commandments, that nation is going to suffer. We look at nations around the world and say, why are they always so poor? Why are they always in poverty? Why are their people in anguish? Because their leaders and their government have forsaken the Lord. Why do the people from Guatemala want to come to the United States? Why do the people from Nicaragua want to come here and find refuge? I couldn't blame them because their governments are corrupt. The people who lead those countries are corrupt and they oppress their people. And no wonder they want to come to a place that says freedom. Come here, enjoy freedom. I'd probably make the journey myself. The people of that nation will suffer when their leaders don't follow God. In verse 19, it says, The Lord humbled Judah because Ahaz... Do you get that? The Lord humbled Judah. He humbled the whole nation because one king refused to follow the Lord. He promoted wickedness in Judah and had been most unfaithful to the Lord. 
It goes on to say, in every town across Judah, he built altars to burn sacrifices to other gods, arousing the anger of the Lord. He led the people in sacrificing his own children on the altar of Baal. When trouble came, he didn't turn to the Lord. Instead, it says that he became even more unfaithful to God and offers sacrifices to the gods of his enemies, thinking, well, their gods help them. Maybe their gods will help me. You see the twisted logic here? The Scripture says that they were his downfall and the downfall of Israel. You see, when we allow ourselves to begin thinking like the world and we begin to take on the practices of the world around us, that too will be our downfall. Ahaz shut the doors of the temple. Wouldn't let the people worship. He started using the temple as a dance hall, as a place for people to come and, and, and do everything except worship God. He contaminated the sanctuary. He used it as all kinds of other things, but he wouldn't let the people worship God. He set up altars on every street corner in Jerusalem, the Scripture says, and told the people, worship these gods. You see where the Lord was upset with him? Hezekiah grew up in this environment, and he saw this horrible example of his father, the king of Israel. And you almost wonder, it was miraculous that Hezekiah followed after the Lord. You go, how can that happen? How can a, how can a godly son come out of such a wicked environment? Because the grace of God... The grace of God that moves on the heart of a young man, 25 years old, who says, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to live my life differently. The first thing he did was open up the doors of the temple and said, we need to purify it and get this garbage out of here. He called the Levites and the priests again, clean this mess up. And they set to work and they began getting all the clutter and the garbage and the trash out of the temple. Took him how long? Nearly two weeks. Almost three weeks, 16 days to clean all of the garbage out of the temple. And they took it out to the valley of, of Hinnon and burn it. When they finally got done, they told Hezekiah, it's cleaned up now. And he said, great, we're going to start worshiping the Lord. In chapter 29, he says, Our parents were unfaithful. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and God forsook them. They turned their faces away from the Lord's dwelling place and turned their backs on Him. They shut the doors of the portico and put out the lamps. They did not burn incense or present any burnt offerings at the sanctuary to the God of Israel. And the anger of the Lord has fallen on Judah and Jerusalem. He's made them an object of dread and horror and scorn. Look, look, you can see it with your own eyes, he says. This is why our people have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives have been taken into captivity. Hezekiah knew why Judah had fallen on hard times. Would you recognize it? If in our own land we've fallen on hard times? Or would we kind of, oh, no, but it's all, it's, yeah, this is the way things go, you know? This way it is. This is the new normal. This is, okay, just get used to it, okay? Some of us have lived in a time where the church doors were open and people came, the lights were on Sunday morning, Sunday night. Wednesday night. And people met together for prayer and sought the Lord. We had revivals. Pastor, we, I'm sorry, we can't do a revival. I've got so many things going on. I guess, you know, hey, I, I might be able to be there maybe one night, okay? How about that? Sometimes we don't want to acknowledge that the practices of the people have any effect on the way a nation goes. But I'm here to declare, the wickedness of our leaders and the arrogance of our nation will be our downfall. When we turn our back on God as a nation, 
Don't think that the outcome will be any different for us than it was for Israel. Doesn't work that way. This Memorial Day, we'll have politicians give speeches. And you know how they always end their speech? God bless America. What hypocrisy. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? Aren't we, don't, shouldn't we ask God to bless us? I'm embarrassed to ask God to bless us. How can we ask God to bless our nation when we're guilty of turning our backs on God? How can we ask God to bless our nation when we allow the murder and the annihilation of the unborn a thousand every day? How can we seek God and ask Him to bless us when we promote drug usage? And since when did liquor stores become an essential business? Since when did, did, did marijuana parlors become essential? But churches aren't? So don't get excited, Pastor. I am getting excited. This is our nation. And if we don't fight for it, and we don't stand up for it, we're going to lose it. Our children are being taught socialism in the classrooms, in the universities. This is the way to go. Wake up. How can we ask God to bless America when we're consumed with greed and corruption at every level of government? Locally, do you ever see any greed or corruption here in Marion? Two and a half million dollars may not seem like a lot of money to the city council, but it sure is a lot of my taxpayer dollars and yours that disappeared and nobody cares. Shame on them. How can we ask God to bless America when pornography has become the scourge of our generation? Destroying our young men and our young women. Destroying their ideas of what godliness and marriage and sexuality is supposed to be. How can we ask God to bless America when these things are just common and normal? We go, well, that's the way it is. How can we ask God to bless America when 860,000 children a year are taken, they disappear into the sex trafficking trade and not a word is said. How many? 860,000 according to statistics that our own government keeps. What happens to them? They're sold over and over and over. Sometimes they end up in Thailand and Vietnam. Sometimes they end up in Europe. God bless America. No. It's time for us to repent. To turn away from our wicked ways. Fall on our faces before God. Say, God, I'm sorry. We ignore the God of Israel and we promote the God of Islam. And Buddha. And every other false God. That, and, and we don't give glory to the one who has blessed us beyond measure. That's a situation Hezekiah faced. Same thing. Same season. What a lesson we have before us, dear church. What a lesson. We better learn from it. We better learn from it. The reforms that Hezekiah enacted brought about the blessings of God. Read these chapters for yourself. We don't have time to read them all here. Read them for yourself in Chronicles and Isaiah. When we choose to follow the Lord and walk in obedience to His Word, it brings God's favor upon our lives. Is this thing working? Hello? Is this working? We say, oh, we enjoyed the favor of God. Yes, we have. But it won't be forever if we don't return to the Lord. It doesn't mean you're not going to have troubles and hardships. In fact, Hezekiah found that out because 
in the 14th year of his reign, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. Assyria, that name sounds familiar. Oh, Syria. Oh, okay. The capital of Assyria is a, is a place called Nineveh. Nineveh. Nineveh was one of the most vile, horrible places ever on the planet to live. Remember Jonah? Remember the prophet Jonah? And God said, Jonah, I want you to go where? To Nineveh and preach against the wickedness of that great city. <laughs> and, and Jonah immediately obeyed, right? <laughs> he said, I'm not going there. <laughs> I have no way. I am God, you got the wrong fella. I'm I'm going that way. And he headed towards Spain. <laughs> well, the Lord found him. <laughs> the Lord caught up with him. Sennacherib came and he knew about his father Ahaz. Ahaz had made these shaky alliances with Egypt. When Ahaz was being attacked by the Arameans, he sent word to the Egyptians, you got to help us. Oh, we're being attacked by the Arameans, and, and they're, they're horrible. And, and no. Did the Egyptians come and help him? Nah. <laughs> when Pekah came and, and took 120, killed 120,000, so he, he cried out to the other, you got to come help. Did they help? No. And so Sennacherib knew that his father was weak. You got a weak father, you probably have a weak son, right? And Sennacherib began to attack the outskirts of Judah. In fact, they kept marching closer and closer to Jerusalem. In fact, they had Jerusalem surrounded. And they decided, you know, we're going to send an envoy, we're going to send the, uh, my chief of staff and my chief military advisor, and uh, we're going to cut you a deal, Hezekiah. Tell you what we're going to do. And this is outside the city wall, okay? And he says, uh, you might as well just give up. You, you think your God is going to help you? You think this God that you serve that nobody can see is going to hear your cry for help? <laughs> He's not going to help you any more than the gods of these other nations help their kings. Hezekiah, tell you what, we're going to give you a peace treaty, a ceasefire. You sign right here, and all your people will take them back to our city. And we'll give them food. And we'll give them a place to live. And they'll enjoy all of the blessings. In fact, he says, hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. This is in Isaiah 36. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He can't deliver you. Your God is weak. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Don't listen to your king. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then each of you will eat fruit from your own vine and fig tree and drink water from your own cistern until I come and take, take you to a land of your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Do not let Hezekiah mislead you when he says, the Lord will deliver us. Now he said this in Hebrew because all the people are on the wall and they heard this. And they're going, well, that sounds pretty good. He's, he's going he's to give us food. He's going to give us our own land. He, he's promised us our own house and our own well and our own fields and vineyards. And ah, Wow, that sounds really good. Huh. You, think, you think Sennacherib was going to really do that? You think he was going to take him back to Nineveh and give him a nice little place to live? <laughs> They'd live on the government dole the rest of their life. Really sounds familiar to what some people are saying today. Come on, come on. <laughs> it's interesting that the wisest among us, we call them Harvard professors. <laughs> Sorry. If you're a Harvard professor and you're listening, I'm, I apologize. No, I don't. Elizabeth Barathot, a professor of, at the law, Harvard Law School, 
She says, homeschooling is a threat to our democracy. Homeschooling threatens not just children, but society. Because the majority of homeschoolers are conservative Christians. And, this, and they indoctrinate their children with religious ideology and anti-democratic notions. We need to do away with homeschooling. Wow, she sounds pretty wise, doesn't she? Her fellow Harvard professor, Steven Pinker, he's blaming the whole pandemic on evangel evangelical Christians. And saying they, they want to meet together and they're just they're spreading the virus and, and, and all these kind of things. And, and in fact, he says, belief in an afterlife is a malignant delusion. It devalues actual lives and discourages action that would make them live longer, safer, happier lives. One has to wonder what wisdom these professors will use when they stand before the God of heaven and say, you don't exist. Hezekiah heard the threats of Sennacherib. He had ridiculed the God of Israel. <laughs> Read it for yourself, Isaiah 37. Isaiah received the letter from the messengers and he read it. And then he went up to the temple and he spread it out before the Lord and he said, Lord, <laughs> I need to talk to you. Almighty God, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, alone our God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You've made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to all the words Sennacherib has made, has sent to ridicule the living God. It's true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste all these peoples and their lands. They've thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they're not gods, only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, Lord, are the only God. That is a powerful prayer. Not long, not complicated. Lord, you've heard what this pagan king says about you. He's ridiculed you. He's told our people not to follow you. Lord, you got to do something. <laughs> Notice three things. Hezekiah's first response. He didn't call up his chief military advice. Say, what do you think? We're surrounded. Think we can get out of here? <laughs> no. He turned to the Lord. When trouble comes in our life and your back's against the wall, who's the first one you call? Mom, right? <laughs> No, he turned to the Lord, and it helps us to know that for the last 14 years, it had been a pattern in Hezekiah's life to trust in the Lord, to depend on the Lord. And God had blessed the work of his hands and had blessed Judah. The people had prospered. The people were worshiping. They, they even invited Israel. Hey, you guys, we're holding services down at the temple. Hey, you guys, we're holding services down here at the church. What are you talking about? Yeah, we're offering sacrifices for Passover. If you want to come, we invite you to come. Wow. And they came. And they had a great celebration. I love that part you read earlier. When they sacrificed. Did you see what they did? Three different times. They bowed before the Lord and worshipped. They bowed down before the Lord and worshipped. And they brought their thank offerings. Lord, thank you. And they brought their sacrifice. They began to sing the Psalms of David. For the last 14 years, the Lord had been faithful. I love that song. All my life, Lord, you've been faithful. All my life, you've been so, so good. 
I don't expect you to change now. You know, you always have more confidence to pray when you're doing the right thing yourself. And Hezekiah had sought with all of his heart to follow the Lord, and he could pray with confidence to say, God, I need you. Secondly, Hezekiah identified the power and the greatness of God. Lord, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kings of the earth, over Sennacherib and Pekah and all the other kings. You're the great king of heaven. You rule from heaven with power and authority. When you know that there's one who is on your side against whom no one can stand, you know what? That gives you confidence. Hmm. He doesn't ask, Hezekiah didn't ask for a battle plan or some kind of military victory when he knew he was outnumbered and overwhelmed. He just said, Lord, you've been faithful to us. You've been on the side of Jacob, and we don't have to be afraid. Hezekiah had seen what his father had done when he put his trust in other gods. That didn't work out real well. Over the past 14 years of your life, have you seen God at work in your life? Those of you who are older than 14, by the way. <laughs> have, you, have you got some examples in your life to say, there was a time we didn't know what to do. There was a time when we cried out to God. For the Henry family, it was just a, a few weeks ago to say, God, we don't know what to do. We don't know where to turn. But to you, O oh Lord, be merciful and gracious and hear our prayer. Touch our, touch our dad. That's our husband. God heard from heaven. And Dave and Michelle are singing God's praises loud and long. Praise the Lord. God has given them a platform in the Indianapolis news and the radio. And, and I pray their message goes out far and wide to say, this is what God did for us. We put our trust in the Lord. It still happens. I hope and I pray you have some of those in your Foot locker, or whatever, cedar chest, or wherever you keep those memories to say, I remember a time when God helped us. And He was faithful. And He delivered us. The last thing we see is Hezekiah's plea. Say, God, deliver us. Not so we can go back to our lives, but rather deliver us so that all the kingdoms of the earth will know that you, Lord, are the only God. You see some purpose there? Our greatest challenge today is still the same as it was in Hezekiah's day, to let the whole world know there's only one God. There's only one God. and There's only one true and living God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God of Jesus, who sent Jesus, to be the propitiation for our sin. You see, when others ridicule and demean our faith in our God, do we run and hide and say, hey, you can't do that? Do we keep quiet and go, oh. or do we stand up and say, no, no, you don't. Lord, you heard what they said. Lord, hear from heaven. <laughs> You said vengeance is mine. I will repay, Lord. I'm just telling you what they said. You might want to deal with that. My prayer is that they come to know Jesus and know that He's the only God of heaven. The answer for Hezekiah's prayer came in a most incredible way. you got to read a little bit farther along in the chapter. In verse 36, it says, And the angel of the Lord went out that night and put to death 185,000 Assyrian in the, in the Assyrian camp. 185,000? One night? One angel? Whoa. They woke up the next morning. Hey, hey, Bob, wake up. He's dead. Joseph, where? He's dead. All over the camp were dead bodies. 
you might want to be careful when you ridicule the God of heaven and you speak out against him and say, don't listen to him. Ah, don't listen to your grandpa. He's just an old guy that just kind of rants once in a while. He'll get over it. Myron, <laughs> once in a while you got to rant, you know. Sometimes you just got to go, listen, my grandchildren, listen. There's a God in heaven who loves us. There's a God in heaven who made us. There's a God in heaven who, who wants us to walk with Him and follow Him. Bob and Kathy, I'm glad your grandchildren are here. Some of them, they need to know that your faith in God is grounded in the living God. God of heaven. Kind of interesting. You say, well, how did that happen? Josephus, the Jewish historian, writes about that event of Sennacherib. They had a mouse problem. In the Assyrian camp, it says that there was a plague of mice who moved through the camp and they ate the bowstrings off their bows and arrows. Or their, their, their bows. And they ate the shoelaces off their shoes. You say, well, that won't kill you. No. No, it won't. But you see, mice carry a particular flea that when it bites you, what do you get? Anybody know? What kind of plague? The bubonic plague. With, when you get the bubonic plague, and, and it starts out as a little blister, and it begins to form a ring around the rosy. You have 24 hours and you're dead. They found that out in Europe. That's where that little song comes from. Ring around the rosy, pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall. That is a horrible nursery rhyme. <laughs> what are we teaching our kids? <laughs> People would carry posies in their pocket to hold up to their nose because of the stench of death. Bodies were piled in the streets and they would come and bring the ashes to throw over the bodies to, to, to quench the smell. The bubonic plague. Ah! Far worse than a virus, by the way. <laughs> There's no cure for the bubonic plague, by the way. You can't get a vaccination. <laughs> but Josephus says, Huh. Plagued by mice. Hmm. I wonder if God could use mice for his bidding. He did use a giant fish one time. Huh. He did feed Elijah with a, a raven. I wonder if God could use the animal kingdom for his glory. We want to be able to ask God to bless our nation, church. It's time for our nation to return to the Lord. We do not think that the blessings we've enjoyed for so long have come to us because of our ingenuity and our, our, our cunning and we've been so skillful. No, 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 no. We have been blessed as a nation. Abundantly blessed. Wow. King Solomon would look at us and go, whoa, I want air conditioning like you have. I just got a servant with a big old palm leaf, you know. Man, you can just go back there and crank it down. Wow, you got color TV. Big screen color, wow. No, we've been blessed. It's not because anything we've done. It's because of the God we serve. It's time for us to return to the Lord and seek His favor. It's time for us to tell our neighbors, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Do you know Jesus? Hey, don't be pushing that Christian stuff on me. I'm not pushing. I'm just telling you that God loves you. And He wants to bless you. He wants to show you His favor. Church, church, thank you, Laney, for picking that song. Build your kingdom here. Build your kingdom here, Lord. And use us. Would you stand with me this morning? It was the Apostle Paul says, these stories are written for your edification. These stories were written in the Old Testament as your examples. 
Father, may we not hear and not pay attention to these stories that you've given to us because they're as practical today as they were in 701 B.C. You're still the God who dwells between the cherubim. You're still the God who is supreme authority over all the kings of the earth. You still rule and reign. Father, we want to humble ourselves before you and praise you with our very last breath to tell everyone we know God's been good to me. He's been so gracious. He's been so kind. I wouldn't eat here if it wasn't for him. Lord, let us tell our children and our grandchildren and our children next generations to come. Serve the Lord. Humble yourself. Give Him your heart. Give Him your life. Follow Jesus. For that's the way of blessing. Father, help us to take this lesson to heart today and to hear and apply it however we can to tell humbly the people we share with in life, this is what God can do. Sing with me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All, all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Amen. Let that song be on your heart as you go and tell somebody how good God's been to you. Amen. Amen.